Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in on your Wednesday night. I uh, hope everybody is settled. I'm sure just getting back from work, some of you, I actually just got home way too, way too short, way too uh, close to the clock here, but just got back, got my dog settled here and ready to go. So I appreciate everybody uh, joining in. Uh, as mentioned, this is part two of our crown lengthening seminar. This one we're focusing on uh, aesthetic crown lengthening cases. So uh, as mentioned, uh, I will leave plenty of time at the end to go over all your questions, um, but not being able to see the screen in terms of your questions, I'll just be doing them um, at the end. And I know from part one that uh, we had so much information that we went a little bit over. So I'm trying to set up this lecture to, to finish a little bit quicker so we have enough time to answer everybody's questions. So without further ado, again, thanks so much and let's get off to the races. All right, so as mentioned prior, in terms of just basic definition of crown lengthening, we're looking at the surgical procedures to expose a greater amount of tooth. But of course, in our case on tonight's lecture, unlike part one, where we really were focusing on more you know, functional or as we call them, maybe more traditional crown lengthening cases, we have an insufficient amount of tooth structure and we're trying to, for restorative uh, functional purposes, uh, increase the amount of tooth structure to rebuild. In tonight's seminar, we're really focusing on these aesthetic cases and we're gonna be diving into that in detail. Uh, of course, the pathologic and iatrogenic will make mention of, and that's just more issues with biologic width, which we'll uh, maybe briefly touch on tonight. But again, the main focus, again, as we uh, keep reiterating, is on these aesthetic cases. So the course objectives for tonight uh, is to everybody hopefully will leave this lecture with some basic concepts uh, and understanding of biologic width for aesthetic cases. Uh, if you joined in part one, you may have uh, helped to understand that the biologic width, where that number came from, where that three millimeter number came from. We're going to go over it again in detail uh, and see how it differs greatly when we talk about uh, aesthetic cases in a make or break type of scenario. Uh, diagnosing and treatment planning, aesthetic crown cases, understanding when it's actually indicated versus not. Uh, fundamentals of tissue and osseous management, of course, always something that we, we need to discuss for these cases from a surgical uh, perspective. Understanding the proper instrumentation, illumination, magnification that we'll want to utilize, uh, some uh, basic incision design uh, techniques for these types of procedures. We'll discuss some of the surgical techniques. Again, this will differ aesthetic cases in terms of uh, some of our suturing techniques versus our more traditional crown lengthening. Uh, and as always, we'll wrap up in terms of some of the post-op uh, care uh, kind of standard of what we go about uh, prescribing pain management, and then talk a little bit about maintenance, because as we all know, we can do the best procedures in the world for our patients. Uh, but if patients don't do their part at home from a maintenance standpoint, you know, all of our work can pretty much lead to nothing. So uh, we'll go over that as well. So here's the overall outline for tonight's course. Uh, again, part one, we're going to be just looking at some of the fundamentals for aesthetic crown lengthening cases, background in terms of uh, etiology and indications for the cases themselves, the biologic width, as we mentioned. Uh, part two, we'll look specifically at some cases, so we'll be able to go through uh, examples of each and, and kind of go into them, get in a lot more detail. Uh, and then as a little bonus, we'll talk a little bit about some alternatives and, and that I think will be a, a fun section for all of us to see in terms of cases where uh, even aesthetic crown lengthening itself may not be enough to, to solve this extreme uh, gummy smile, let's call it. So we'll, we'll dive into that. And again, our last section, again, post-op and maintenance, and we'll wrap it up with some conclusion. So that's going to be our outline for tonight. <clears throat> so we'll start here with part one and just get a basic understanding again of our fundamentals. So when we look at these aesthetic cases, there's some uh, you know, basic factors in terms of what we're looking for. And the most common one that uh, we, we think about is excessive gingival display. Uh, again, what we call you know, the quote unquote gummy smile, patients that smile show an excess amount of, of gingiva and that's part of their chief complaint coming in. The other thing that goes hand in hand with that, though, is we have to match that with what the radiographs show us. So we'll discuss that. But we're looking for things like uh, crestal or even in some cases, supercrestal bone level. So that will correspond 
to some of this uh, excessive gingival display. And this will help us diagnose these cases properly because we have to understand when it's a case that can actually be uh, you know, treated via aesthetic means versus a case that may actually not be uh, as a result of any of these and doing aesthetic lengthening is not indicated. Uh, and then the other thing we look for, long radiographic or short uh, clinical crowns. We wanna have that as one of our indications as well because whether or not uh, the case may be indicated from you know, an aesthetic standpoint, we have to make sure the actual tooth structure itself could uh, you know, support uh, having any of these types of procedures done on them. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, crown lengthening in any form will require some amount of bone removal. Uh, so if, if we have a situation where we potentially don't have enough of a, uh, you know, uh, root length, that could be a consideration. And then again, from a treatment planning standpoint, the other thing that goes hand in hand with what we talked about, excessive gingival display and that corresponding radiographic supercrustal bone, a lot of times that results, again, what we see is that short clinical crown. It looks like they've got these very uh, small and stumpy uh, looking clinical crown. So that's another indication, another sign of what we look for. So diving into that right off the bat now, when we talk about a short clinical crown, why is it that we might have uh, this type of a situation going on? And there's a couple different reasons why a short, uh, a short clinical crown may present itself. We're gonna look at each of them. So first thing is that we, we try and see for a short clinical crown, is that gingival margin at the CEJ or is it not? And if it is at the CEJ, so again, we've got a short clinical crown or gingival margin is at the CEJ, not above, not coronal to the CEJ. So if that's the case, chances are a short clinical crown is as a result of excessive incisal wear, grinding, clenching, obviously just natural wear and use over time. And so part of what we wanna do from a diagnosis and treatment planning standpoint is try and identify the parafunctional habits, uh, occlusion and or occlusal uh, you know, trauma might be contributing to this as well. So we really wanna try and identify why it is that they have this excessive incisal wear. But again, if that gingival margin is at the CEJ, we're, we're really looking at this more of uh, from a restorative standpoint, not so much from a, a periodontal dash, periodontal surgery, aesthetic crown lengthening type of procedure. Again, because that gingival margin is at the CEJ. So that's gonna be one of our uh, key indicators. Now on the flip, is a situation where, as we just said, that gingival margin is actually coronal to the CEJ. And then that's when some alarm bells start to go off in terms of maybe this isn't something with ex excessive incisal or wear and something that we need to uh, address from a strictly restorative matter. Maybe there's something else going on. So when we have the situation where that gingival margin is coronal to the CEJ, we can branch off two different directions. And those two different directions that can be the source of what's going on, uh, one are delayed passive eruption, which is really the essentially the primary part of our topic tonight. But another reason that could be happening, as we're all aware of, is gingival enlargement. So uh, that could be the case. And of course, uh, as we all know, in cases of gingival enlargement, again, keep in mind, uh, in the past, we used to call this gingival uh, hypertrophy, but in fact, the, the literature has gone back and we found out that the, the issue going on is uh, actually in the uh, epithelium and not in the connective tissue layer. So gingival hypertrophy is no longer the proper term. We now call it gingival enlargement. That's why you're seeing that term up there. Uh, but in cases of gingival enlargement, then what we're really doing is we're diving back into the person's medical history. We're looking at stuff like their medication, uh, hereditary and, and genetic possible uh, linkage. And of course, as you're all probably familiar with, there's a lot of different medications out there that as a secondary side effect cause this gingival enlargement, like some of the uh, hypertension medications. Nifedipine is just one of several examples. Uh, cyclosporin, another example, some of the, for some immune compromised cases. So, um, so again, important to identify because we may have cases where, again, that gingival margin is coronal to the CEJ, but if it's as a result of the gingival, uh, of, of gingival enlargement, the etiology is completely different, and the direction we're going from a treatment planning standpoint is totally different. However, in situations where we've got delayed passive eruption, that's when we're going to be diving more into the, the cases that we're going to be talking about tonight, and that's really what our focus is. So 
This is just kind of one of many examples we'll talk about. We've got these crowns that appear clinically to be very short. We've got this excessive amount of gingiva. Uh, and again, we're trying to identify, is this because of gingival enlargement? Is there any gingival enlargement, pseudo pocketing going on? Uh, or is this as a result of excessive incisal wear? Or in fact, is this something to do with altered passive eruption uh, or some other factors that we'll talk about? So uh, this clinical presentation along with the corresponding radiographs are gonna be the key uh, to helping us decide of those three branches that we saw, which one it is and which direction we're gonna be going. And the hope is that by the end of this course, you're gonna all be very comfortable in understanding how we go from what that picture was prior to having an end result uh, that looks you know, beautiful and stable, uh, just like this. So what we have to understand is the etiology of having that excessive gingival display and what are the main factors. And like we talked about, the primary one that we're gonna be seeing over and over again is altered passive eruption, which we will talk about shortly. Now, in some cases, we've got that incisal wear, and then we've got some compensatory uh, eruption that occurs. And then we've got another situation known as vertical maxillary excess, which we are going to touch about, uh, we are going to talk about, and I'm going to really touch down a little bit more about that when we get to our alternative uh, bonus section uh, in the end and see how that comes into play. But these are usually the, the three primary etiology factors of that excessive gingival display. And like I said, the primary one we want to focus on for the purposes of tonight are, is altered passive eruption. Now, what is altered passive eruption? Well, some of uh, my old faculty at Penn uh, back in the late 70s, of course, I wasn't uh, around at that time, but um, what they came up with in terms of definition and classification for this uh, was that they broke it up into two different types and two different subgroups. So the first type, when they looked at altered passive eruption, type one and type two, is where you had situations where, again, that gingival margin was coronal to the CEJ, like we saw on that other slide. Except in type one cases, you had an adequate width of keratinized or attached tissue that was present, like we saw in that previous picture, for example, whereas type two cases, they found that they had that margin coronal, but they actually had an inadequate amount or a very minimal amount to no, uh, to no amount of attached tissue. Then they broke that up even further. Like we talked about what we're seeing clinically for the gingiva, we also have to match up corresponding with what we see uh, from the periapical radiograph. So then they also looked at groups A and group B to see where the actual bone level was. And was that bone uh, crest apical to the CEJ or was it at the level of the CEJ? And again, based on where those were located, that helped in terms of the classification of what degree of altered passive eruption was there and therefore what the treatment would be. So you can see going looking at that exact same uh, classification, but now looking at it uh, on the right side of the screen, what some possible treatment options are. You can appreciate the fact that depending on what type uh, of altered eruption it is, whether it's a one with an A or a one that corresponds with the B or the two with the A and the two with the B, how we go about it from a treatment planning and an actual surgical uh, treatment is completely different. So in a, in a case 1A, where again, the osseous crest is apical to the CEJ, but we've got a lot uh, of, of attached tissue and that gingival margin is incisal, really all we're needing to do is, is have a gingivectomy with an apically positioned flap. But the majority of the cases we're going to be looking at when we're talking about these traditional aesthetic crown lengthening cases, again, are these altered eruption cases where we've got an excessive amount of attached tissue uh, and that bone is at or above the CEJ and doing the gingivectomy by itself simply is not going to work, which will explain exactly why in a short few slides. So we're going to have to uh, incorporate a combination of uh, tissue management along with osseous resection. So we're going to be talking about that. So really the, the point of this slide was to help uh, appreciate and get that point across that the, the actual uh, narrowing down and defining from a diagnostic standpoint of which specific category of, of eruption is there is critical because, you know, you can see from a treatment planning standpoint, it can, it can vary quite significantly. And we also, we obviously wouldn't want to do osseous resection if gingivectomy only is indicated uh, and so on and so forth. So we'll get that from a better uh, standpoint in a little bit.
The other thing I did want to touch on are some of the, the classic, uh, you know, periodontal literature numbers, just in terms of tooth form, shape, uh, gingival zenith, diameters, uh, you know, all those types of things. And the reason I want to go over that is because as we begin to go through our cases and then as moving forward, uh, hopefully uh, a lot of you will feel comfortable and start kind of giving these cases, uh, you know, a shot and treating them. We also have to take into effect and into account that when we go forward to restore these, whether we keep the, uh, the patient's natural dentition or if we go about them from some type of a uh, restorative standpoint, a crown or veneer, whatever it might be, we also want to try and match the, the tooth form to, to make it as, again, ideal as possible. So from some of these uh, classic articles from the periodontal literature, we can uh, appreciate, again, some of the average width and length ratios for some of those teeth. Uh, in terms of the central, the lateral, and the canine. And again, the vast uh, significant majority of these aesthetic cases were typically looking at a canine to canine area. Although again, once we learn these principles tonight, you could be doing it from molar to molar. But again, looking at these, talking about it from a traditional aesthetic standpoint, we're usually focused on that canine to canine. So you can appreciate the average width to length ratios of each and see uh, how each tooth uh, actually varies in terms of their sizes and their diameters. And again, what we discussed also about the gingival zenith is also very important to understand. And this actually comes into play when we go into our uh, surgical uh, cases as well. So part of the reason for that is because as you can see for the gingival zenith, uh, depending on whether it's a central, a lateral or the canine, each of them is located at a slightly different location. So uh, if you look at the maxillary central there, the gingival zenith, again, according to this class of article from Chu, is usually approximately one millimeter uh, slightly distal from the middle, uh, the midline of that tooth. So uh, again, you look at the lateral, it's about 0.4 millimeters distal, and it's really the canine that essentially is matching up uh, more or less in a dead center position. So this is really important because when we look at uh, going about our gingivectomies and wanting to, you know, sculpt the tissue in a very precise uh, aesthetic and specific way, we have to make sure we do a good job of defining where that gingival zenith is. So if, for example, on a central, we make that zenith right on that midline, uh, as we can see, according to that, you know, classic literature of tooth form, we would actually be putting the, the zenith of that tooth in slightly the wrong position. Now, in a posterior area, you know, if we're off by a half or one millimeter, no big deal. The patients aren't noticing it. You know, we wouldn't be able to see it and restoratively probably wouldn't make a big difference as well. Uh, but again, in these aesthetic cases, uh, you know, with patients, of course, who are uh, obviously anxious, difficult, wanting to get that perfect smile and us as clinicians wanting to provide that, you know, perfect smile for them being off by that millimeter or so is, is going to make a much bigger difference. So that's where that gingival zenith comes in. Uh, and basically that gingival zenith level, regardless of, you know, again, where that is specifically in terms of off the midline, uh, it's also, you know, typically more or less about a millimeter uh, in terms of where the, the actual point of that zenith is <clears throat> off that uh, corner of the, you know, the bottom of that clinical crown. So that's some of the terminology there. So now if we look at some of these things as a whole, uh, and now we add in where the papilla height is, you can now see again the differences, not only from the central, but to the lateral and the canine. And again, what you can appreciate is if you look at a maxillary central tooth, uh, the, the level of that papilla height on the mesial is a little bit more coronal than it uh, traditionally is on that distal side. The exact opposite is true when it comes to the laterals. It's, it's actually flipped. Uh, that mesial is more apical than the distal. And again, when we look at our canine, our, our canine tends to be in terms of a papilla height standpoint, uh, again, uh, right dead center. So the canine kind of acts as a little bit of a easy bullseye marker because not only is our zenith dead center, but our papilla heights uh, ideally, again, are pretty much dead center as well. So it's kind of a good you know, baseline to go by. And then we've got our adjustments there for you know, the zenith and uh, the papilla heights for the other two um, you know, so accordingly. And you can even see in that maxillary central, 
where that zenith is located were not right at that midline. So if that zenith was put in the middle, it would make the entire uh, appearance of that central look obviously very different. So now that we got a little bit of you know, the understanding in terms of just uh, the appearance and, and width and papilla height uh, of that aesthetic area, we do want to revisit this biologic width consideration because Basically, what will make or break uh, these aesthetic cases is really comes down to this biologic width measurement. And this is really the, the game changer. And we're going to explain why uh, right now. So again, as we discussed last time, and as all of us know, the biologic width by definition is that natural uh, distance of a tooth from the sulcus down to the alveolar crest of bone. Uh, and as we mentioned, as we all think about biologic width, the, the number we always kind of learned in school and the number we just kind of go by by heart is three millimeters. So we always say more or less that sulcus is about a millimeter, the epithelial attachment is one and so is the connective tissue attachment. There's three millimeters, that's our biologic width. Now, what we talked about for those of you who were in the part one of the course, and we're gonna go over this one more time because it's very critical to this section, is well, where did this three millimeter number come from anyways? You know, did this just come from a ton of studies? Did, you know, where do we even get this? We, we all assume it's three, but why? And the answer again to that, as we mentioned, was this classic periodontal uh, study done way back in the, in the mid to late 60s. And this will help us understand why this number really can't be the one we go by. And, and as you can see, what happened in this study is that they looked at these cadavers and basically what they did is they, they took measurements on all these cadavers and they took measurements for each uh, of these factors we talked about, connective tissue, epithelial attachment, and the sulcus. But basically what they did is they literally just took all the numbers that they got and they developed mean values for each of them. So the mean value they got for the connective tissue attachment was 1.07, the epithelial attachment was 0.97, and the sulcus was 0.69. Therefore, when you do the math and you look at those numbers and you add them all together, what you see is that those three numbers added together equal about 2.73. Now, of course, they are not going to, you know, uh, publish and say, all right, the biologic width is 2.73. Nobody's going to remember that. So what they basically did was that they rounded up and they said, well, 2.73, that's about three millimeters. And there you have it, folks. So there is the answer to where this three millimeter number come from. But why is this such a big deal? Well, as we mentioned, these values are mean values. So if you look at that box I have highlighted there on the left, Look at the discrepancy in the range from these cadaver measurements that they took. The sulcus depth alone, they had some cases where the sulcus ranged to zero. There was no sulcus. All the way up to 2.62 millimeters, the epithelial, uh, attached epithelium from 0.28 to 3.72. That connective tissue attachment almost at zero all the way up to 3.36. So if you kind of want to look at it from an extreme standpoint, in the most minimal cases, you had a biologic width that was basically almost one third of one millimeter, 0.33. Uh, and if you look at the extreme range, you had a biologic width measurement that was over eight millimeters in diameter. So uh, again, if you were to look at that, you can appreciate the fact that three millimeters is a generic number, but how, how does that make sense for some of these cases if in some patients or in some of the cadavers, I should say, they were getting values that might have been one or two or six or eight. So how could we have three millimeters be some kind of blanket statement number? And that is going to be what comes into play when we talk about our aesthetic cases. So this uh, literature that came out in 2008 was kind of a, a game changer from the perio literature in terms of how we go about treating these aesthetic cases. And the reason this Perez, Smuckler and Nunn article was such a big deal was because what they determined and found was that there were actual clinical variations in that dimension that existed between patients and even between different arches and teeth. So what that means is if you look at uh, these cases and you look at uh, on the left side box, the maxillary uh, dimensions, and if you look at the right side box in the mandibular direction uh, dimensions, and if you look at both from the uh, facial side and the palatal side, you can see the numbers slightly vary between each of them. Uh, 
So basically, oh, excuse me, I just hit that. So basically the, the take home message that this article found, which was so significant and really turned uh, the biologic with on his head is that they determined and found that depending on where you're working in the mouth, whether it's on the maxilla or the mandible, the palatal side, the facial side, and even to each individual probing measurement, the distal lingual, the center, uh, the center, the mesial, wherever it might be, each individual spot might have a slightly different measurement. And therefore, because it has a different uh, measurement, it also has a different biologic width dimension. So we cannot go by that generic three millimeter number. We have to look at each individual site that we are going to be treating and, de and determining for each of those individual sites what that uh, complex, what that biologic width complex for that site is. And, and we're going to put that into use from a clinical surgical uh, treatment planning standpoint when we get to our case. So again, take home. If we go by three, it's not going to work. You're going to see why. We need to actually uh, understand that each individual site may have a completely different measurement and we need to check them for each of them. So again, the classic concepts that uh, were there in the past, as we just mentioned, the, was that, heck, the biologic width and the denture gingival complex is always three millimeters, which we now can understand from that article and what we're gonna discuss. That's not the case. We can get away with that type of stuff more with our uh, you know, functional cases when we're lacking tooth structure because we're essentially taking into how much tooth structural and feral we need when we're going about our traditional crown lengthening cases in part one. So that doesn't play as big a role, but again, in the aesthetic zone, we, we cannot use this three millimeters as this universal number. The other classic concept that used to exist prior to this type of uh, literature being out there was that crown lengthening of periodontally healthy teeth can be achieved by gingivectomy alone. That is an absolute no-no. A big reason for that is again, what part of this article determined and what we're gonna find. And basically what that is, is that uh, why this measurement is so important is that if we only do gingivectomy by itself, because of that biologic width, dimension, and complex, if we do gingivectomy alone without doing the corresponding osseous where it's indicated, all we're going to get in the end is gingival rebound. That bone during the healing time is literally going to push uh, that tissue back coronally. And what looked beautiful at the time of the procedure of the gingivectomy, and oh my God, there's this radical change and there's this longer cl clinical crown. It's not going to take a very long time for that patient to come back and say, it all grew back. Also, the other thing we talked about uh, as a classic concept in the past was that following surgical crown lengthening, that flap uh, should be positioned at the level of the osseous crest. And we now know that that's not the case, again, because we're going to be doing that corresponding uh, osseous surgery, and then we're going to be uh, placing that in a more apical position. So it goes to show in a case like this, how much that thinking has changed over time. Uh, in the past, we would have thought in terms of treating something like this, the we may only need to do a little bit of gingivectomy and do no osseous whatsoever, which of course would not be the case uh, because we would get gingival rebound. And then in terms of uh, uh, trying to understand, well, okay, if we have to do some osseous resection, how much do we have to do? The thought was always, well, we'll just do three because biologic width equals three millimeters, but that would end in, in, a, in a lot of different uh, you know, complications and you know, disaster outcomes. And we're going to see those in a little bit and understand how we can avoid that. So it changes our thinking. So now that at least we get a little bit of an understanding in terms of fundamentals, uh, definitions, what they are, what we're looking for in terms of where that zenith is going to be, where our ideal papilla position is going to be, and again, uh, understanding that biologic width, we can talk a little bit about some of the instrumentation. Uh, and then knowing that we can dive into uh, our, our actual clinical cases. So again, as mentioned before, we, we always, of course, appreciate the help of our sponsors. And when it comes to basic instrumentation, uh, Paradise Dental, Dental Technologies was gracious enough to, to sponsor us. And obviously, we're going to look at the, the basic instrumentation we need to do these aesthetic cases. Now, one positive of an aesthetic crown lengthening case uh, in comparison to doing those 
um, more traditional crown lengthening cases is that from an armamentarium instrumentation standpoint, we need a whole lot less equipment than we do for those traditional cases. So that's great. So what are some of the basic things that we need? Well, of course, being a periodontist, you, you can't do anything without a probe. It's like being restorative and you know not having an explorer. So we always want to have our periodontal probe. Um, obviously, they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and some of them come in measurements of three, some of them come in measurements of five, some come in individual. Uh, for the purposes of what we're talking about, we really want to focus on these, uh, you know, per millimeter marked probes, again, because we're going to be working with such uh, precise numbers and such small measurements that uh, we want to have them in individual increments. So these UNC 15 probes uh, are great. Obviously, they, they make them in 12 millimeters as well, which usually for our aesthetic cases work completely fine as well. So not a problem for that. But take home is obviously one, we need a probe. Two, we need the one with the individual marking and not the one with multiples of threes and fives. Uh, the other thing we always need in, in any of these types of surgical cases, of course, are going to be some of our area specific curettes. Uh, you know, looking at the anterior section, we usually uh, can focus more on our 1-2 and our 7-8, our 7-8 being universal, our 1-2 almost being a little bit of a variation on a universal, but uh, having a little bit of a longer uh, blade and longer handle so, you know, we can kind of uh, access areas a little bit better. Uh, of course, if, uh, if somebody feels a little bit more comfortable with the, the area-specific ones, we've got our 11-12s to the mesials and our 1314s uh, for our distals. But like I said, usually in this aesthetic zone, um, the 7-8 and the 1-2 uh, are, are gonna do the job for you. But regardless, you we definitely need them uh, as we go about uh, our procedure. Uh, classic, again, of course, we're gonna need our surgical blades. You can't do periodontal surgery without a blade. Now, the, the three that you're always gonna find out there is the number 12. 15 and 15 C. And as you can hopefully see from the picture, there are differences between them. Now, the 15 blade is kind of that classic traditional blade that we usually uh, see when you think of that classic, uh, you know, scalpel blade. Uh, the differences of the other two are a little bit more nuanced. The number 12, as you can see, has got a little bit of a hook to it. Uh, and that usually comes into play in more difficult, uh, hard to reach areas, especially for working uh, on a distal site. So you know, usually speaking in terms of these aesthetic cases, uh, a number 12 is not one that we really have to stress out too much about. Uh, but I still have it there simply because due to that type of hook shape, uh, there are some clinicians that I know when they're going about doing their gingivectomy, feel like since it already has a, a natural bend to it, when they go to kind of make their arc around that papilla and create that zenith, they feel like that bend, you know, gives them a little bit of uh, better tactile feel and a little bit more precision as they do it. So, hey, as they say, whatever's comfortable in your hands. So it's it's definitely uh, an option in that sense. Uh, the 15C is different from that 15 in that, as you can see, it's a much smaller uh, and finer blade. Um, a lot of periodontists, frankly, uh, like working exclusively wherever they are in the mouth with that 15C. They feel again, it's a little bit more of a, you know, of a surgical style, uh, precise blade, um, especially if they're working in an aesthetic area or an area where, you know, the tissue might be uh, thin or they're, they're worried about, you know, possible tears. They, they feel more comfortable with that 15C. It's a little bit finer and they feel like there's a little bit more tactile sense and control. So uh, again, up to you. Um, you can perfectly comfortably use that 15 traditional and, and, and you'll be fine. But again, want to obviously expose uh, to all of them. Uh, one of the other instruments uh, that I want to focus on is the Boozer instrument. Uh, it's just another fine uh, elevation tool that can help us when we go to elevate our flap. We'll you know, probably see that in a picture later on, uh, but it's just a little bit more of a fine elevator in terms of the tissue. But the most vital and classic one that we have uh, in terms of helping uh, maintain our flaps reflected uh, against osseous to give us that clear line of sight and allow us to do what we need to do is the Pritchard. Uh, this one is is really uh, can't work without uh, in terms of any type of perio surgery for me. Um, and again, they, they come in different shapes and sizes. They're ones that are more directly straight, like you see on that left side. And then our friends at PDT uh, also have ones where you can see that longer end has a little bit more of an angle to it. So again, depending on 
where you're working uh, in the mouth, uh, your angulation of where uh, the that end is able to hold up against that bone and reflect your tissue is a little bit different. So again, depending on where you're working in the mouth and where your grip is and where that tension is being placed, uh, that extra angle can can kind of help in terms of a, a comfort and a visibility standpoint. So uh, also though, uh, again, just a critical instrument for us to use is that Pritchard. The other thing that's great with uh, PDT is that we have obviously our traditional blade holder, no big deal for that. Uh, we can get those obviously anywhere, but uh, they also happen to have a uh, blade holder that will bend. So I don't have that picture on there, but literally the area where that 15 blade is will actually be able to click down in something like, a, I think, a 25, 45, and almost up to like uh, close to like a 90 degree bend, which is very cool, again, depending on where in the mouth that you're working in. Uh, but again, being able to uh, angle that blade uh, can, again, assist you depending on where you're working in the mouth. Uh, and being able to really access and, and, and get a good incision. So it's cool to be able to have the option to keep it in a more kind of traditional position, but if we wanna kind of adjust it as we go along to be able to adjust it. So, of course, as we talked about, we always need our rotary instruments. We can't do any of these uh, aesthetic cases and our osseous recontouring without the rotary instruments. So uh, the first and the primary one in terms of the aesthetic crown lengthening, again, uh, that we want to focus on our, our, our round burrs. So <clears throat> again, for our traditional cases, we, we utilize a whole different armamentarium. We're looking at end cutting burrs, um, sometimes some diamonds as well. So we've got some different options. But again, when we look at these uh, aesthetic cases, we're really focused on these uh, diamond and carbide round burrs. So the, the two take homes for everybody are the following. Number one, as I have there highlighted, you got to make sure you've gotten a surgical link burr. Without that surgical link burr, it's way too short. Uh, the access, the tactile feel, and the control are totally different. The longer the burr for you to be able to, to get in there and, and, and work uh, cleanly, the better. So always make sure when you order, you order surgical specifically, or else they're just going to send you the little mini guys. Uh, and then in terms of the diamond versus the carbide, you know, that's another one of those things where, uh, you know, whatever's more comfortable in your hand, uh, you know, personally, I would say, I think the diamond uh, is, is much easier to work with. Um, I, I feel like the carbide does a little bit more of an aggressive amount of removal. Uh, it also has a tendency, if you're not careful, it can tend to, when it uh, comes in contact with the bone, it can kind of skip and, and, and ditch sometimes. So, you, you may end up doing a little bit more uh, aggressive, you know, the osseous recontouring than you were hoping. Whereas with that diamond round, I, I find that you're able to get a little bit more of a smoother, uh, precise and, and, and fine amount of, uh, of removal. So, you know, that being said, I've obviously used the carbide if I needed to in cases, it's no problem at all. But I think uh, the diamond ones tend to be uh, a little bit of an easier way to go. Uh, in any case, again, we always need some uh, tissue forceps, something to help us uh, adapt the flap, get an idea of where that tissue is going to sit, make sure we're comfortable with how we are, and, and then also assist us when we go for our suturing. Uh, obviously, we need scissors. We got to cut those uh, sutures off. Pretty obvious one there. Uh, and then, of course, we need our uh, traditional needle holder and, and sutures. Sutures, of course, we'll talk about uh, in just a little bit. Uh, when it comes to these cases, again, uh, if needle holders, those classic, you know, bulkier hemostats are all you have, not a problem, you know, have to work with those regularly and they work, you know, completely fine. However, uh, as you might imagine, working in an aesthetic area, these very precise uh, procedures that we're doing, uh, you know, being able to utilize the Castro Viejo night and day, uh, the, the tactile sense, the control, the ability to kind of get through tight spaces, which again, when we're talking about these aesthetic, uh, aesthetic cases, we've got very kind of precise areas where we want that needle to go through the tissue and have, have things sit. So Castro Viejo is definitely uh, a game changer and a way to go. Now, the other two instrumentations that we're going to talk about that really are only going to apply for very specific type of aesthetic crown lengthening cases where we are planning to restore the cases. And by restore, what I mean is that we're not going to be saving the patient's own dentition. We're not going to literally 
do our cryon lengthening down to the CEJ and, and uh, you know, move on from there with the patient's natural dentition. The treatment plan, for whatever the reasons are from the treatment planning standpoint that we'll discuss, uh, is calling for restorative work, crowns and or veneers. As you'll soon find out, the only way that we can make those cases work predictably is by having this mock-up template. And we're going to talk about that briefly. This is the number one biggest pain in the butt problem I have as a periodontist is being able to get these mock-up templates. Uh, they're the most essential thing from a treatment planning standpoint, which again, we'll, we'll go into more detail as to why, but we want to mention that as part of our instrumentation because it's part of our kind of treatment planning tool. Uh, and then as far as lasers come, always a popular topic, always a popular thing to discuss. Do you need to do these cases with a laser or not? Uh, and the answer is you uh, absolutely can. And if you don't want to and you want to go a traditional blade route, you absolutely can do that as well. Uh, we will show examples of both. Uh, so you can see, you know, the, the use of both in the pro and con, but just know that lasers can absolutely be utilized for the gingivectomy portion of this type of a procedure. And of course, part of the reason and part of the popula uh, popularity uh, in regards to using these lasers, these diode lasers, uh, they, uh, they really help from a hemostasis standpoint. Uh, you usually have a little bit of less bleeding. So therefore, a little bit easier, easier to just visualize what we're doing and where we're working. Uh, the other part with these diode ones is that we're, we're not affecting the hard tissue, which we, we don't want to do uh, in these cases until we've done our gingivectomy and flapped the area. So we really, again, uh, are looking for such a precise amount of, of removal of osseous that we'll be going through that you know, lasers offer us a way to do it, uh, you know, with good hemostasis. And of course, for a lot of people when they're wanting to document and, and really have nice pictures to show for their office website or whatever it might be, it obviously from a, you know, a marketing standpoint, can't avoid the fact that, uh, you know, people find it very cool to show that they've got this, you know, fancy laser that's painless and, you know, does this work for them. So uh, take home message again, lasers absolutely indicated and we will uh, have a case uh, which you're seeing that we will show in detail utilizing the laser. And you can see uh, by doing that gingivectomy uh, with the laser, you can see kind of just from the gingivectomy before and after, uh, you can do a very clean uh, incision, have a very minimal amount of bleeding. Aesthetically, it looks good. Again, we can appreciate the change uh, in the clinical crown just from a small, uh, you know, uh, amount of removal. So again, lasers are definitely... Uh, an option, whether we're doing them just for one tooth or going across the board. But like I said, we will be looking at this case in a lot more detail in a little bit. So what I did discuss though, uh, at our first part of the instrumentation is this mock-up. Now these mock-ups come in all different types of shapes and varieties. So uh, this is just one that I'm showing you. We'll, we'll look at another one um, in a later case. Of course, myself being a periodontist, uh, I'm not a restorative dentist, so I do not fabricate uh, these templates themselves, but uh, I can tell you from a treatment planning standpoint, the whole uh, basis of where these templates come from uh, and that we're gonna discuss again is basically the following. Uh, if the plan in an aesthetic case is to restore the teeth, whether it be with crowns or veneers, prior to us starting uh, the surgical procedure, what information as a you know surgical person we need to understand is where are the final margins of that crown and or veneer going to end now of course when you're doing this with the patient the way we traditionally and easiest can do this is we've got the patient's models that we've taken alginates on we can then go and do some wax ups and we can then go and present the patient these wax ups and say okay you know, here's what we're envisioning for your crowns or your veneers to look like. What do you think? And obviously the patient, uh, you guys can, you know, do the back and forth and see if they're happy with the look, the diameter, the, the length of the clinical crown, whatever it might be. Once that ideal uh, look is determined, the only way the, the, the surgeon is going to know where that margin is going to end is if you communicate that to them with this mock-up. So what that mock-up is basically going to be telling us is where that gingival margin is going to end. And you're going to see shortly how then we translate 
that information of where that gingival margin is going to end to then tell us how much gingival recontour and then, as importantly, osseous recontouring we're going to do. Without knowing that information, we are literally flying blind. So if uh, what happens many times with me, for example, is we'll get this aesthetic case. The plan is to get new crowns. And basically it's like, well, do the aesthetic case, then we'll make the crown. And that whole process needs to be the exact reverse. If we're planning on doing crowns or veneers, we need to be able to provide you with that exact final uh, you know, position to match what the patient wants things to end at. So we need to plan the end first. And once we've determined what that end is, we need to have this mock-up that can communicate to us where those margins are going to end so that I, therefore, somebody who's going to be doing the surgical part will know where that ends, as opposed to saying, hey, just go and do the lengthening, and you know, which I get a lot, hey, just go lengthen these and then we'll figure it out. That's going to end up in, in, in disaster, I can guarantee you that. So again, this is just one example. There's a, a, a lot of other ones that are out there, but having some type of a template in the mouth that will tell us where those margins are going to end, sorry about that, uh, will then help at least uh, give us an understanding of where those uh, margins are going to be. Now, some are better than others. These, this one, for example, is one that uh, was, was sent over. I don't think it's the greatest either because it's still kind of hard to, to ideally picture where it's going to be, but we'll show another one in a later case that will hopefully help uh, give a better visual. But again, the key is we need to understand where that margin is gonna end so that then we can actually go and then do our surgical part, which we'll discuss why in this next section. So let's just say though, for all intents and purposes, we now, uh, we have our instrumentation, we've, we've got everything ready to go, whether it's uh, an aesthetic uh, case with veneers or just keeping the patient's natural dentition. The next thing we have to understand how to do is our basic incision design. So we're going to touch on that. And the two different types of incisions that we have, it's very similar to what we had in our traditional cases. Mm. Our first incision is the classic sulcular incision. Now, what a sulcular incision is, again, by definition, is a incision that maintains the entire marginal gingival tissue. The key to any type of a sulcular uh, incision is that as we do it, uh, not only, of course, as the name says, we are in the sulcus itself, but we want to make sure that we are actually all the way down to bone. So we have to make sure from a tactile standpoint that we can feel that that blade is up against the bone. So you can look on that picture on the right hand side. You can see where that little thin pinpoint of that blade is in the cross section you can see that that blade is not only within that gingival sulcus, but you can see the tip of that blade is touching the level of the osseous crest. So that is one type uh, uh, of an incision that we're going to utilize, and we're going to show that for you in just a little bit. Now, the second type that we have to learn, and that is going to be uh, the primary one when we're going to be doing uh, these aesthetic cases, is the submarginal incision. Now, the submarginal uh, incision is different in that it's an inverse bevel incision. And how it's different is that rather than starting at the sulcus at that coronal most portion, it's actually going to be starting apical to that marginal, uh, marginal gingiva. Now, just as with the sulcular incision, we have to make sure that we feel that blade touching the bone. So again, nothing is floating out in space within the tissue. Both of those are angled and hitting uh, the actual uh, the bone, except with the submarginal, we are doing it apical. And so in these cases, submarginal incisions by definition are indicated in areas that have uh, an adequate uh, or significant amount of keratinized tissue which of course then helps explain why in our aesthetic cases where we've got these excessive gingival displays, this is the incision that we go with. Now, to help review one more time, uh, you know, corresponding to what we also did in part one, how that incision works, so everybody can understand the steps with it, uh, we've got a couple parts to it. The, there's a couple incisions. The, the first initial incision is parallel to the long axis of the tooth. As we said, to understand, well, how apically are we going? We understand it's not in the sulcus and it's apical. Well, how apical? Well, when we're talking about, in this case, our aesthetic cases, we will know how apical we're going to go because, again, 
we're going to have one or one of two things to go by either that mock up in terms of the restorative standpoint or the patient's uh, the, their natural CEJ, which when we again get into the surgical part, we'll, we'll discuss. So bottom line is we will know what our reference point is, and that will tell us where that incision is actually going to go, how submarginal we're going to be going. So our first incision, you can see on that cartoon on the right hand side, we're no longer in the sulcus. Uh, we're now uh, in the submarginal area where we are down to bone and we go about and we do our first submarginal incision. And there you can see again, we're not in that sulcus, we're again in that submarginal zone. And then what happens is after we do that, we can then come back and after we've done our submarginal incision, we can use our instrument to raise that primary flap, as you can see on that apical area. But all of that tissue collar that is above where we did our submarginal incision is still attached around the tooth. So now what we need to do is we need to come back and essentially do a secondary sulcular incision all around that tissue collar that we've left. And now we can come around and do that sulcular incision on that remaining collar that we have. So you can see now, unlike our first incision that was outwards and submarginal, now we're coming back and we're doing a more of a traditional sulcular down to bone uh, to, to free up that tissue collar that's right around the, the gingival margin. And then our third and final incision is going to be perpendicular now to the root. So if you look at that cartoon on the right hand side, you can see that dotted line that is coming perpendicular. So we've got that collar of tissue with which our second incision we came and did our sulcular and now we've now freed it up from a coronal standpoint, but now in order to completely free it up, we need to do that perpendicular incision to re release it down uh, at the bottom. Another word for this incision is to call it uh, scoring, uh, scoring the bone there. We're scoring that tissue up against the bone. So we're coming again from that perpendicular standpoint. And now after we've done uh, that step as well, here you can see again in the cartoon that perpendicular angle that's been done. We now will have an area of tissue. Sorry, I went back. Uh, we'll now have that little bit of extra collar of tissue that we're going to actually be able to just, whether it be with our Gracie curettes that we showed, uh, you know, back action chisels, any of our instrumentation, uh, curettes probably going to be the easiest way to go. Or you can just with your uh, tissue forceps uh, or hemostat, you can literally be grabbing that tissue and just removing it off. And you can end up with a situation like this, where we've again uh, <clears throat> done our uh, incision and we're left with an area that now we've done our submarginal incision and we're ready to, to, to flap to go into our osseous. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. So again, at least from a uh, incision design standpoint, we have an understanding of uh, sulcular versus submarginal when we're doing which. And now we've got to imagine that we've done our incision, we've done our gingivectomy, and now we've got the area as we had it in that slide before, like right here, we've got a gingivectomy done, we've got a longer clinical crown already, but now we've got to do our corresponding osseous resection. So in order to understand the osseous resection, there's two different types of resection that we do. One is called ostectomy and the other is called osteoplasty. And the easiest way to differentiate the two, uh, ostectomy is removal of supporting bone, whereas plasty is the removal of non-supporting bone. So uh, what is it that we mean is that if you think about the bone that is directly uh, you know, around the actual gingival margin that's, that's, you know, supporting that bone right at that crest, that level uh, of, of osseous resection is called ostectomy. But if you think about the areas more apical, uh, let's say you were working, for example, on a, on, a, on a tori during an osseous surgery, and you're removing this big bulky shelf of bone, that is bone that's called non-supporting. It's not right around the actual tooth itself. It's not going to result in any kind of uh, loss of support or destabilization of the tooth itself. Therefore, that bone is considered non-supporting. So doing that type of osteus is considered osteoplasty. Now, in general, when we're talking about doing crown lengthening, you really can't do one without the other. You're usually com combining some variation of both of these, uh, uh, of these types of uh, osseous resection. 
But when we focus more on our aesthetic cases, again, because it's a very pinpoint amount around that tooth area, we're actually going to be doing a significant amount, in some cases, almost exclusively uh, ostectomy, because all of that bone that we're removing, of course, is the supporting bone uh, that's around that tooth as a result of that altered eruption. So last step before we get into the actual procedure itself, we obviously now have the background. Uh, we know what type of instrumentation we want to use. We've understood our incision design. Uh, <clears throat> and we've got all those steps ready to go. And now we know what we're going to be doing from an osseous standpoint. And of course, our, our last step is we actually have to be able to, when we go to the surgery, be able to see things very well. And I can tell you, especially in these cases uh, that are so precise and aesthetic, uh, not having you know, the proper illumination and not having adequate magnification uh, is going to be the difference between success or not. Uh, as you'll appreciate with these aesthetic cases, uh, a half to one millimeter uh, of visibility and resection will make or break uh, the final result. So you want to make sure, of course, whatever you utilize, you've got a, a very good field of vision. Uh, of course, our, our great support, one of our supporters from uh, Orscoptic, uh, I can tell you just, you know, the reason I work with them, number one is their, their lighting. Uh, I've never had uh, a lighting, uh, you know, type of, uh, of loop support that has been that strong. Uh, the battery I have, I work all day, I'll have an eight or 10 hour day doing surgeries all day long, and I, will, uh, I won't be recharging my battery uh, until every two full, sometimes up to three full full days of work. So I have a very long lasting uh, Endeavor XL. That's the one on that right side battery. It lasts a tremendous amount of time. The amount of strength I get from an illumination standpoint is so strong that probably 85% of the time I'm using it on its lowest setting. So uh, that just goes to show you how strong the light is. And it's important again, because it's also where that light is focused. It's not scattered around. I've had uh, different lights I've used over the years that might be strong, but they're a little bit more scattered and spread out. They're not really uh, focused and zoomed onto the area where my corresponding field of vision is. Uh, obviously, I, I find that to not be the issue at all with them. So just, uh, you know, food for thought in terms of, uh, you know, visibility. Uh, and then in terms of the, the magnification and the loop itself, uh, this is the what they call the tempo frame. This is the one I have in the sense of it's extremely lightweight. Uh, I'm, I'm wearing the loops all day long. The last thing I need is, is more pressure, you know, on my head between obviously now with N95s and everything else that's there. So these uh, loops, number one, they're extremely lightweight. Uh, they're very durable uh, and they're very light and easy to work with. Uh, and this uh, term of, in terms of quality of visibility and field of vision, this term called CRI, uh, you know, loops in the past, you know, 10, 15 years, they weren't getting really past 60 to 70. And now uh, this specific, uh, you know, loop is going over 90. So bottom line is the clarity and quality of what you're seeing is, is really enhanced. So like I said, for somebody like myself, we're talking about aesthetic cases and working in precise areas. Being able to see things as clear as possible with the best amount of lighting possible uh, is, is a big game changer. So that's um, <clears throat> really why, uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm blessed to have them support and, and why I, I recommend them in terms of a, a great lighting option. So always have to point that out. Uh, last but not least, if we've gone through doing our procedure, now we're going to be looking at what we're going to be doing from a suturing standpoint. And once we've put that last piece of the puzzle together, we can then start looking at things from a surgical standpoint and between our diagnostic instrumentation and treatment planning, uh, we can then put all the pieces together. So from a suturing standpoint, a couple of things we wanna talk about. Uh, a, a brief mention in terms of background that we mentioned again in our part one lecture as well. Uh, and that's basically some basics in terms of sutures themselves. So uh, there's many different kinds, as you all know, there's tons of different options out there. Um, <clears throat> there's some that are resorbable, there's some that are non-resorbable. Uh, two of the most uh, you know, popular in terms of the resorbable ones are the chromic gut and the polyglycolic acid, sometimes called vicro. Uh, they, they differ in terms of their tensile strength and how long they last. Uh, in terms of uh, length of time, a chromic gut suture will usually last up to seven to 10 days. Uh, as you can see with a vicro suture, Technically, people sometimes think a vicryl is non-resorbable. Uh, 
but it's not that it's non-resorbable. It's just that it takes a long time for it to actually resorb, as you can see, four to five weeks. Now, there's pros and cons with everything that you use. I can tell you from experience that using a chromic gut suture, the good, the pro of it is that, again, it resorbs. If you have a patient that is coming, traveling from a long distance, doesn't want to, uh, you know, come for another follow-up or reval. Is going to be traveling, uh, you know, whatever the situation might be. Being able to utilize that chromic gut suture, knowing that it will go away on its own, of course, is a big uh, kind of relief. So that's one kind of uh, consideration to keep in mind. Um, However, I can tell you using chromic gut is also a little bit of a pain in the butt in the sense that it wicks blood a lot. So essentially every time you make a pass and make a tie, my recommendation to everybody is to get a wet gauze and wipe it down and remove the blood because what you'll find is as you go through your second and third pass, it will become much stickier. It will stick to the lip, the chin, everywhere. And it becomes a little bit more of a mess and a pain to work with. Now, a Vicro suture on the flip side, a lot easier to work with, doesn't wig blood nearly as much, passes through pretty simply uh, and very good to use. The only downside with it again is that, of course, we have to see that patient uh, to, to remove the suture. Now, uh, the other one that I don't have circled there, but just to give you an example of a non-resorbable suture is the silk, as you can see up there on the right. Now, silk is a beautiful material to work with. It's smooth as butter. It feels great to use. It feels great to tie. Uh, and, and it's a great material. So, you know, part of the question is, well, if it's so great, then why don't we see more of it? And the reason for that is compared to all different types of suture materials, uh, silk wicks the most amount of bacteria. So in, in patients with very poor oral home care, uh, you know, having somebody that already doesn't really do a good job of cleaning uh, and then having a, a suture with, which just attracts bacteria like crazy can, can obviously create a lot of issues in terms of inflammation uh, and poor healing. So that's kind of, uh, you know, another type of way to think about it. But just wanted to give those out there for food for thought. Again, to go over this very briefly, what do all these, uh, you know, fancy numbers mean? That number on the upper left, the 4050, of course, is referring to the thickness of the suture. Remember, the bigger the number, the thinner the suture is. So a 50 suture will be thinner than a 40. A 60 will be thinner than that. Uh, for the purposes of what we do, you would never go smaller than a 4.0. Uh, in terms of aesthetic crown lengthening, I would never be using anything uh, smaller uh, or thicker, I should say, than a 5.0, either a 5 or a 6, because again, we're working in a very fine, thin area. So uh, please don't go out and buy a 3.0 unless you're planning to go to the rodeo and try and lasso something down. Uh, but again, that's what those numbers refer to. The other number you often find that correspond to a lot of these different uh, uh, suture companies is these numbers that are in relation to the needle. So the PS2, FS2, uh, P3, these all correspond to the actual needle itself uh, in terms of the cutting edge, in terms of the length of the needle. As you can see here, the PS uh, or another variation of it is an FS2 needle is a much bigger and longer needle as opposed to the P3. Uh, which is a much smaller and finer needle. So uh, again, depending on where in the mouth you're working, you don't want to be using a P3 needle, for example, to be passing through in proximal areas of a molar. It's going to be a nightmare because it's just not big enough to pass through. Uh, the same being said, in these types of aesthetic cases that we're going to be talking about, going through a uh, aesthetic zone in the maxillary central area, uh, using a PS or FS2 needle that's much bigger, can it be done? Absolutely. But again, it's a little bit more aggressive, more of a chance of tearing uh, and a bigger pain to work with because, again, it's such a fine area. So, again, just wanted to talk about the, the differences between those just in terms of definitions. Keep in mind, depending what suture company that you go and work with, they, they each have their own nomenclature of, of stuff. So what's a P3 for Ethicon might be called something different in another company, but just wanted to show them as one example. So in terms of suture design, uh, there's going to be two that we're going to touch upon and in terms of specifically our aesthetic crown lengthening cases. Uh, 
The simple interrupted is one everybody is probably familiar with where we're literally passing through our, our needle from the buckle over to the palatal side and tying it off. But for the purposes of our cases, for these aesthetic cases, the one we're gonna focus on is called the internal vertical mattress. Now, this is slightly different than doing our functional cases where we also were talking about vertical mattress sutures. However, the internal vertical mattress is different than the uh, traditional, or you can call it an external, external uh, vertical mattress. And basically, as you can see from the picture, the way this suture will work is that we will start our first uh, entry point on the apical area. And what you're going to find in our cases that we're going to discuss and a take home message for everybody is that when we do these aesthetic cases, we are going to be tying our knot on the palatal side. This is the only type of uh, perio surgery where we talk about doing this. We do not tie it off on the buccal side, uh, unlike every other case. Now, obviously the question is, well, why, why do we do that? And the simple answer again is aesthetics. The last thing we wanna do is to have a patient smile and see uh, six to eight knots uh, sticking up right on their gum, especially if they've got excessive gingival display and a, and a high smile line to begin with. So we switch it up and we do our, our knot on that palatal side. So what that means is that our first pass, as opposed to being on the buckle like it normally would be, is going to be on uh, the opposite side. And basically what we're going to do, we're going to go on to the apical area first. We're going to pass through that apical area through the uh, uh, interproximal space to the opposite side. We're gonna pass through the apical area there. And then we're gonna get up close to the tip of the papilla. We don't wanna be all the way at the tip. If, we're, if you're too close to the tip of any uh, area of, of suturing, no matter what it is, you're gonna get tears. But of course, we don't wanna to be too apical as well. Otherwise, we're not getting the type of approximation as we want. We'll, we'll look in the surgical cases and we'll, we'll see it uh, better visually, but we're gonna go up in that coronal area. We're gonna pass through, again, close to the tip, about millimeter and a half uh, below roughly. And then we're gonna pass through that opposite side, go through that coronal part there, and we're gonna tie that off. And what basically that's going to do, it's gonna help us in terms of a tissue approximation. Uh, it's gonna really get our, um, from a, any vertical mattress is going to be uh, putting our tissues and adapting it very apically against that bone the way we want it to be. So once we've done uh, our osseous resection, we want to make sure that our tissue and where it's holding is corresponding to where we wanted uh, everything to end based on our either again CEJ or our template that we're using. So the internal, uh, internal vertical is going to be our go-to for these types of cases. All right, so we've done a lot of yapping about all the background and uh, hopefully uh, all of you have a little bit of an understanding in terms of uh, you know, diagnosis, uh, instrumentation, uh, what we're gonna be doing in terms of incision design, uh, osseous resection, uh, and again, some of our suturing. So now we're gonna actually look at the cases themselves. So there are a lot of considerations uh, that we look at as basic guidelines uh, for any type of an aesthetic case. As we mentioned in part one, we wanna establish the etiology of that gingival uh, display. We wanna make sure it's a, as a result of some kind of uh, excess bone at or coronal to the CEJ, excess amount of uh, tissue as opposed to having something secondary to uh, you know, medication or having some type of excessive wear just due to wear. Now, part of what we're gonna do is something called bone sounding, which we're gonna talk about, which is gonna help us verify that dental gingival complex dimension. And, and by that, what we're talking about is a really fancy way of saying we need to bone sound in order to identify for each site what our biologic width is going to be. And we'll show that for you briefly. Uh, assess the tooth form and anatomy. We talked a little bit about uh, what you know, more traditional uh, zenith point and papilla positions are gonna be which is that next point, evaluate that papillary dimension, try and determine that ideal crown to, to length ratio. Uh, if we're doing uh, <clears throat> some type of restorative case to understand where things are gonna end. Again, like we said, we have to establish and we have to know before we do anything, what is going to be our fixed reference point. And we're gonna explain in a second what the two options for that are. And again, make sure we do a sufficient amount of ostectomy and osteoplasty. 
How are we going to know how much we do? Again, it all comes based off of that uh, preoperative bone sounding dental gingival complex determination. That's going to be what's going to tell us how much ostectomy and osteoplasty we're going to be doing. So those are some of our guidelines that we're going to be looking at. So as we mentioned, here is going to be our decision tree for any type of an aesthetic crown lengthening case. It comes down to two, two very basic things. Are we maintaining the patient's own natural dentition or are we planning to restore those teeth with new crowns again and or veneers, restoratively bottom line. So based on which one of those two we do, we're gonna have two different reference points. Let's focus first on the right. If the patient's uh, own natural denti uh, dentition is going to be used, our reference point that we're gonna be going by is the CEJ. Again, if we've got this excessive gingival display, that bone at or coronal to the CEJ, we're not going to be visualizing that CEJ by look. Again, that's why there's a short clinical crown. It's not that they don't have more tooth structure, it's that it's hidden by this excessive uh, gingival display. So when we do our aesthetic cases, it's very easy because our lengthening is going to be at the CEJ. If we did lengthening beyond the CEJ, well, now all we're doing to that patient is that we're, we're giving them recession, which is obviously not something that we want to do. So from a treatment planning standpoint, the natural dentition cases are very easy to plan because we know our reference point is going to be the CEJ. Now that becomes different if we look on the left and we're looking at doing new crowns or restorative work. As we said, our reference point is completely based off of the final uh, gingival margin level of what those crowns or veneers are going to be. So the only thing that is gonna communicate that to us properly is going to be that mock-up template. We won't be able to just uh, get a note and say, hey, you know, we need two millimeters on each site. Because again, as we've now started learning about from our biologic width, each individual probing site that we're gonna see is going to have a slightly varying uh, you know, gingival complex dimension. So the amount of uh, resection that we're gonna move is going to be varying on each individual site. So we can't just say, hey, just give me two millimeters. We need to know precisely what everything is gonna be. So those are gonna be our two reference points. So the one thing we're not going to dive in too much detail, but for the sake of completeness, I do want to point this out to you. When you do these types of aesthetic cases, you can actually go about them in two different ways. There's two staged approaches. There's the one stage approach where, as we mentioned, and these are the cases that we're going to discuss for the purposes of tonight, we're combining in one visit our measurements, our gingivectomy, our flap, and our corresponding amount of osseous resection. That is one way to go about doing it. However, there is another way you can go about doing these cases and that's by doing a two-stage approach. And what that two-stage approach is, is that what you're doing is that during your first stage, you're actually not doing any gingivectomy at all. You are flapping the site. You are doing the osseous resection, again, based off of measurements that you determine for that gingival complex and where you're planning on uh, the, the case ending in terms of the margins. But that first visit, all we are doing is the osseous resection. We are putting the flap right back where it was and we're letting the site heal. Now, after that area heals, we are expecting that we're going to get some uh, gingival shrinkage a little bit because we've removed some bone. So we're expecting a little bit of uh, apical migration. But once that is done and it heals, the next stage is to come back and to actually then do our gingivectomy and then allow that to heal before we go to our final restoration. So again, it adds a little bit more confusion and complexity for the sake of you know, what we're discussing. Both options work. There are arguments of pros and cons to doing each. In some cases, whether we're not completely sure of where our margin might end for the veneer, or in some cases where uh, clinicians are a little bit uh, concerned, they're scared if maybe they do that osseous and GV and they may overdo it. Sometimes they, they choose that two-stage approach because they feel like it's a little bit more conservative. They'll do that osseous first, let things heal, and then go from there. Um, I still feel, and, and the cases will demonstrate and, and what we're talking about for the purposes of tonight, uh, if we've done things properly from the treatment planning standpoint and our measurements, uh, 
the one stage approach is is really you know uh, the most common and a great approach to do uh, not to mention the fact that for the patients themselves having to go through one procedure versus two and having to heal once as opposed to going through two different healing cycles is obviously a much uh, a bigger plus from a patient standpoint as well so uh, but i did want to point out there are two ways to go about it but we're really focusing on this one stage approach so with that being said, we'll jump into our first case here. And here is our first case. And what we can see on the smile analysis is that on the stage one smile, uh, they don't really show too much. But if we ask the patient to smile very big, this patient came in with their chief complaint, again, being excessive gingival display, not being happy, feeling like there's a gummy smile. Of course, I'm not going to let you guys see it from that far away. We're going to zoom in here. And you can see uh, more of a stage two style of a smile. What are a couple of things that we can appreciate? Well, number one, we can see short clinical crowns. Number two, we can see a, a large amount of attached tissue. And of course, the only way we can make these things work is if we match them up with the, uh, adequate corresponding radiographs. And when we zoom in on those maxillary centrals, what can everybody appreciate is that if you look at where that osseous crest is located, Keep in mind, again, traditionally, the osseous bone and, and conditions of health is between one and a half to two millimeters apical to the CEJ. But in cases like this, where there's altered passive eruption, you can appreciate the fact that that gingival uh, crest margin is right at the CEJ of the tooth. So from a diagnostic standpoint, we're seeing excessive display, short clinical crowns, we're now correspondingly from a radiographic standpoint, seeing bone that is right up near the neck of the tooth. Therefore, we can diagnose this case in terms of it being an osseous uh, altered passive eruption case, and we can go and plan it in terms of an aesthetic uh, gingival display and an aesthetic crown lengthening case. So once we've determined that, we've got now our next step, which is to determine what this gingival complex is. Now, keep in mind that in this particular case, the patient was not interested in doing any restorative work. Yes, as we can all very clearly see, there's a diastema between eight and nine. The patient was completely happy with it, had no desire or intention to address it. She was fine with her teeth. She just wanted to show more of them. So keep that in mind too uh, in our cases. So if that is the case, then what we know, therefore, is that our reference point is going to be the CEJ. So what we now have to do is we have to determine how much gingivectomy we're going to remove. Uh, and once we do that gingivectomy, what is our corresponding osseous going to be? So the way we do that is doing this bone sounding. So once we've gotten the patient numb, we can then get our probe that we mentioned earlier. And what we're doing with our probe is that we are uh, putting that probe into that pocket all the way down to where that bone is. And what you can appreciate when we do that in this particular case is the following. First of all, what you can see is that those bone sounding measurements are not uniform. In some areas on one tooth, they're all the same. In some teeth, they are not, and they vary. On that tooth number seven, for example, you can see each individual site has a different bone sounding measurement. And why is that so important? Again, if we went by our traditional biologic width and thought, well, you just remove an equal amount on every spot, you can now see that the dental gingival complex on the distal is different on the direct facial and it is different on the mesial. So the corresponding amount uh, of gingivectomy and, and osseous that we're going to do is different. So once we've done this bone sounding, we know the distance right now from the gingival margin to where the bone is. And so knowing that, we now have an idea of where that bone level is more or less present. Now, once we know where that bone level, I'll go back one more time here. Once we know where that bone level is present, we can then also, we know our reference point is the CEJ. So what we can also do is we can have a, a measurement or we can feel where that uh, uh, CEJ is. And once we know what that is, basically this patient's dental gingival complex, we just have to keep that ratio the exact same. What that means is where that gingival margin ends right now. So if we look at the direct facial of number eight, for example, five is our measurement. What we have to have guaranteed is after, after we do our gingivectomy and after we do our osseous resection, the final location, that measurement is going to correspond. 
because if, it, if we remove too much bone, we are going to get a corresponding uh, recession when things heal. If we do not remove enough bone, we're going to get gingival rebound. So we'll go through that and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. So now what we've done is we, we know where our bone sounding measurement is. We now also have done some probing to know where the location of our CEJ is. So what we've now done is we know from a uh, uh, incision design standpoint that we're going to be doing our incisions at the level of the CEJ. So we can come, we can either make marks with our probe on the tissue, or of course, like we can see here for easy presentation, we can use an indelible marker. We can make our lines of where that CEJ is located. Then we can also make a line of where we are planning to have our gingival zenith, which we talked about in those earlier slides as well. Now, uh, some things to keep in mind, as you can see where that GV is going to be done corresponding to the CEJ, hopefully everybody can see that you do not extend that incision into the actual interproximal papilla. The last thing we want to do when we're removing this excess tissue for our gingivectomy is to then go interproximately and end up removing the patient's uh, papillary tissue as well. That's not what we're doing. We're going line angle to line angle at the level of the CEJ only. So what we can see then here in our first step, we've got all our measurements uh, set up. We know where our CEJ is located and we can go and do our gingivectomy. In this case, we're using a 15 blade. And you can see immediately, as soon as we do the gingivectomy, we see this radical change in the patient's smile. Everything looks beautiful. And this is basically how we want our case to end. And you can see how that all looks. But of course, we can't just do the gingivectomy and not do any type of osseous surgery, because if we do that, because of that thick bone at the level of the osseous crest, that bone will literally push that tissue right back coronally in a short amount of weeks. So after we do our gingivectomy, we now have to do our second part, which is do our flap. And now when we raise that tissue, you can all see just how much bone is there. That bone, again, is all the way up at the level uh, of the CEJ. So then we come back to that question of trying to understand, okay, now we've done it. How much actual bone do we have to remove? Thanks to our bone sounding measurements, we know on each site exactly how much bone we therefore have to remove. And knowing that number, we can then, of course, use our probes if we want to do it as a further guide and measurement. You can even, if you want with your probe, make a mark at where that four, five, six, whatever that bone sighting measurement is on the bone. And doing our combination of osteoplasty and ostectomy, we're now doing our osseous resection. And you can see from that osseous resection how much bone we've removed at each site. And you can see that on some sites, there is a slightly different amount of bone removed than others. They don't match because again, as we saw in the measurements, the measurements don't match, which is why it's so important from the treatment planning standpoint that we're getting each, each individual site that we are planning to lengthen. So now what you can see with that internal vertical mattress is you can hopefully now see why we do the knots on the palatal side. Because when we do this internal vertical, you can see the amount of suture material that's actually showing is, is not very much. So the patient can smile. And of course, they might show a tiny bit, but they're not going to have all these knots that are sticking there. So you can see that suturing, again, from different angles. And basically, during the healing period, you can start to see the shifts that occur. So this is just one week after. <clears throat> yep. We're going from there. This is at three weeks. You can see that uh, tissue there in the central where by one, and actually this was even at two weeks later, where it looks like in that central area, you've got a little bit of a discrepancy in the papilla, but again, given time to heal, which is really important. You gotta let these things heal for a, a good amount of time. We can see things starting to heal and move back into a good final position. And here it is now seven weeks later. We've got a, a really you know, healthy amount of tissue. We can see that we're, we're happy with the amount of tooth display that we have. Obviously, most importantly, the patient's happy. Uh, we can see no signs of inflammation uh, and we can see uh, a, a very equal amount of uh, gingival margins all the way across the board.
So looking at, let me go back one more time, looking at where we started to looking at it just a week or two after post-op. Again, there's the three week post-op and here it is by seven weeks. So you can see that gradual change that has occurred. And so there's that patient's final smile. You can see what a big jump it is in terms of what they're showing in terms of gingival display from where they had started. So there's her smile from the before and here's the smile after. So that's our first case we're gonna go through. We're gonna go through another case, similar concept, similar situation, same type of concept, excessive gingival display. We can see here the gummy smile, especially during that stage two. Here it is in an up close and closer view. Again, just excessive gingival display, which once again, we look at the radiographs and, and we have this similar situation. So again, always remember the PAs, have to match up with what you're seeing clinically. We've got that excessive amount of bone that's present. So what we're finding again, the short clinical crowns, excessive display, <clears throat> and we've got that tooth form present. So what we're doing again, we're doing our measurements prior to starting. We're first determining where that CEJ is. We're taking note of that. We can do it on a piece of paper. We can do it on the computer, however we want. But we take note again at each different location. After we do that, we do our bone sounding. So if we go back here, let's just focus on this picture on the left. Let's go back here a slide. We can see where our CEJ is. We're roughly around three and we're doing our bone sounding. And now we're closer to five millimeters. So we know that discrepancy. We know what that distance is from our CEJ up to where our bone level is gonna be. So that's gonna help us when we go to plan our actual osseous resection. And like we said, we do this at every single point that we're gonna be treating. So now we go again, planning again, in terms of where our zenith is gonna be. Here you can see the marks made, uh, the slight uh, horizontal perpendicular marks there that are where the CEJ is located. So we have an idea of where our uh, gingivectomy is gonna be. We make our marks again. And in this case, you might remember earlier from photos, we use, the, we use the laser. So you can see now we go about using our measurements and we do our <clears throat> laser to do our gingivectomy. After we do our uh, gingivectomy, we extraorally just verify that we're, we're happy and we're at the CEJ as we hope. We can then go and after we do that, we can raise our flap, do our sulcular incision at that point and raise the flap. And in terms of beveling, this is just smoothing out some of the tissue. So there's our flap, there's our pre-osseous resection. Again, we've got a significant amount of bone. And then again, in terms of uh, determining the amount of ostectomy, again, everything is based off of our bone sounding measurements. So in this case, that amount of bone that we needed to remove based on our bone sounding and CEJ measurements corresponded in this case in that two to four millimeters. And so we go about doing our ostectomy and our osteoplasty at each site based on what our pre-op measurements are. We then go with our internal vertical mattress, which you can see where you can you know, hardly notice where the sutures are for aesthetic purposes. And there you can see what the knots look like on the palatal. Uh, after this, I'd go back and cut those ends and make them a little bit shorter, but that was just kind of right at the time. And so what you can see and why I like showing this case, not only we can we see the transition from weeks one to week two and then the long term. But the other reason I like showing this case is what we can see at four weeks is if you look at number nine compared to number eight, we're actually a little bit apical. So what ended up actually happening in this case is we... Uh, ended up when we did our osseous resection it was only by about a half a millimeter, but we actually ended up removing a little bit more bone than we were hoping to remove. And you can see that a little bit more bone makes a big difference. And this is why I said the precision part makes such a big difference. Now the patient herself from start to finish couldn't have been happier. She was thrilled. And again, as you can see, she was keeping her own dentition, which is why we had the CJ as a reference point. But again, if we want to be really nitpicky, we look close and we say, ah, number nine is about a half millimeter uh, of a discrepancy there. So again, the slightest bit of difference 
makes a big difference on the result. And this is again why we have to measure each site as closely as we can and we cannot go by a generic number like a three. So here she was before, here's, here she was after. And of course she herself was, couldn't have been happier despite even that little discrepancy there. So we're gonna show a different case here with crowns. And this is a good case because all this talk about mock-ups and why they're so important and what, what a big difference they make, this is gonna be the take home uh, you know, case to show you why it makes a difference. So this patient, uh, as you can see, the, the, the issue in this case wasn't that they had short clinical crowns, but it was rather that they, they felt that they wanted to get new, uh, new teeth restored and they wanted to make their, uh, their clinical crowns longer. Uh, this, patient, uh, this patient happened to be on TV and, and do some news and felt like they just wanted to have more teeth that showed, uh, longer teeth, and wanted to get them crowned. And I think they were crowns or they were veneers. So that changes the game for us. And I wanted to show this case because this was the mock-up that was sent my way. So again, like we said, in cases that are done from a restorative standpoint, our entire surgical work is going to be done by getting some type of a corresponding mock-up that's going to tell us where that margin is going to end so that when we do our bone sounding measurements, our gingivectomy and our osseous, we can then calculate exactly how much we're going to do at each site. Instead, this was what was sent our way, a suck down, which obviously looks pretty terrible. And when we called and said, well, we can't work with this, they, they didn't understand the whole mock-up thing. And they said, no, no, just go by this and just give us a little bit of removal. So we're going to show you why this causes problems for uh, the, the consideration of, well, why don't we just do the aesthetic lengthening? And then based off of how the aesthetic lengthening heals, we'll reverse it and we'll make the crowns or veneers based off of the healing. And we'll show that in a moment. So Based off of the template and the measurement that we were told, uh, two millimeters here, three millimeters there, we, we did our gingivectomy. We flapped the area. That top picture, I'm sorry, is a little blurry, but I hope you can see the difference of, of osseous resection from, from before and our post-osseous. Again, we've got that uh, supposed mock-up, but now we can see it's no longer right at that uh, level with the bone. There's our internal vertical mattress again we can already see that there's a, a, a much longer clinical crown that's there uh, from start to finish. Now, this patient, again, was left to heal. And then the plan was, okay, we'll just reverse engineer it. Thank you for lengthening these teeth on our behalf. We've got a lot more tooth structure. Now we can go back and make this patient the, the veneers that we were planning on making. Well, here's how the patient ended up. I saw this patient uh, probably maybe six months later after they got their teeth. Now the patient couldn't have been happier. They were very happy with these final uh, prosthetic. Uh, I don't remember again, if they were crowns or veneers, they were thrilled with them. They had no clue, but personally I wasn't happy and I'll show you why. There's again, that beginning to end. So when I look at this, what is it that I'm seeing right away from a perio standpoint? If we look at the gingival margins, six, seven, and eight, especially even on the distal of nine, maybe even uh, the, the middle level of 10, what I'm seeing there is some inflammation. And sure enough, when this patient was coming in for cleanings, uh, their complaint, they love the way everything looks, they couldn't be happier, but they said, you know, the weird thing is that when I brush my teeth or when I floss, I tend to get bleeding. And of course, the reason they're getting bleeding is because they've got a biologic width violation. Because again, once the lengthening was done and healed, they never pre-planned where these margins were gonna end. They just went back, prepped those teeth. In this case, they, they prepped to the point where it was going to cause this type of uh, iatrogenic biologic width violation. And so now they've got this chronic uh, position of you know, having this chronic bleeding happening. So this is exactly why I show this case because this is why you do things in reverse. If this was the plan of what the final veneers were planned to look like, if we made a mock-up based off of this, then from the surgical standpoint, we could have known, okay, here's where they're hoping these gingival margins to end. We could have done the proper amount of osseous to tissue removal based off of that and probably avoided this type of a situation. If it was me in a situation like this, it would be removing uh, all of these crowns or veneers, uh, you know, putting them back in temps, letting the tissue heal and, and making something new. But again, I'm not a restorative doctor. 
uh, you know, this is not a case restoratively in my hands or in my practice. I'm just showing you the case uh, to show. So we're going to show you a difference of one uh, of a mock-up that went a little bit more on the reverse. So here you go, a patient that again has excessive uh, smile, excessive tissue there, planning on getting uh, some restorative work done. Again, similar things that we talked about principles in terms of bone sounding uh, <clears throat> and pre-planning measurements. But the difference here is that the, the actual final length of the restorative work that they were planning on doing was communicated via a mock-up. So we were able to then go back and actually plan where our, our final margin was gonna end. And you can see with that mock-up on, we're able to, based on our measurements, understand our proper amount uh, of bone and tissue removal that we're gonna do. And you can see how that mock-up can sit. Again, there's different types, but this is one that literally sits right over uh, the patient's teeth so we can get our corresponding measurements. And again, obviously I'm not restorative. These aren't, uh, these aren't the stuff I did, but here are the pictures that uh, I got restorative from that patient from when they were done and when they finished. So you can see uh, restoratively the difference in terms of the healing. And again, the difference of having some kind of a mock-up to go by uh, that will communicate to us where those margins are gonna be as opposed to not having them. So this is it over time from two weeks and then three months later. And again, uh, in terms of the tissue look and the result, obviously uh, a, a much more you know, beautiful result in terms of what we hope to have. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see the difference between having a mock-up of any kind before to communicate that tissue position before uh, versus after. So the bonus thing we wanna talk about very quickly, cause I know we're gonna get to the question section in another 10 or 15 minutes is let's say we've got a situation where doing these aesthetic crown link things, we still have too much of a gummy smile. What the heck else do we have as an option? And of course, sorry to scare everybody with these pictures, but there is a treatment known as lip repositioning. This was the bonus material we wanted to throw in. Now, what ends up happening, of course, as we talked about, a lot of people have these gummy smiles. We talked about the reasons about them in terms of altered passive eruption. However, in some cases, we've got these situations where there's vertical maxillary excess and a hypermobile upper lip. And if we've got a combination of vertical maxillary excess plus this hypermobile upper lip and or a short upper lip, we now have a situation where doing an aesthetic case by itself is not going to be enough. And we're gonna demonstrate that very quickly here for you. So you've got two options in these cases. You've either got to go through orthognathic surgery or we can look at, the, at doing these mucosal coronally position flap, AKA lip, lip repositioning. So basically how it works, We've got the same situation going on in terms of our altered eruption and our uh, excessive bone. But what we're doing in terms of the lip repositioning is we're identifying the location of the mucogingival junction. And then based on how much we wanna lower that lip, uh, that, lip uh, that gingival distance, we, we take two times that measurement up in that apical area and the mucosa. And that is where our second incision is gonna be. So one is at the mucogingival junction. Our second one is apical, two times the amount of the gingival display that we are hoping to remove. And we're literally going with our 15 blade and we are removing that amount of tissue until it looks like that. And then that most coronal amount of uh, alveolar, uh, excuse me, that mucosal tissue that's present we're gonna then go and suture that down to our attached tissue. And you're gonna end in these situations where you've got this excessive smile and you've lowered that lip. So again, look at the photo on the left. They, there's nothing there in terms of short clinical crowns or their need in this case of doing all this type of uh, additional uh, aesthetic crown link thing because then the, the teeth are gonna be uh, ex excessively long. So the only thing left there is, is this lip repositioning. So just to show a case that was done um, uh, at, at Harvard Dental School, again, I'm, I'm part of the periodontal faculty there. This was one of our residents that we you know, did on this case. So again, what you can see, you can appreciate altered passive eruption, uh, the, the bone that is at or coronal to the level of the CJ. And you can see that excessive gingival display. So the thing with this was we did go about doing the aesthetic crown lengthening. Again, our diagnosis, altered passive eruption, the short upper lip, 
but we did things in phases. So not only did we do everything we just talked about in terms of our gingivectomy and our aesthetic crown lengthening, you can see that very thick amount of bone. But in conjunction to doing that, we also did that lip repositioning. The reason for that being, even after we do our aesthetic crown lengthening, uh, we, we still have an excessive amount of, uh, of display and the patient wanted to get even more of that covered, but there's only a certain extent. Again, our reference point being the CEJ, if we remove more than that, we're gonna now give this patient uh, recession all over the place and really long teeth. So we had to do that same lip repositioning where first measurement at the mucogingival junction, and then the second one double of that gingival display that we hope to remove. And we were able to get that patient into a point where they again, didn't show this. So is this something we have to do in all cases? Of course not, but uh, I did wanna show this as a bonus to show alternatives that exist. So these are our cases where treating it via aesthetic crown lengthening possible uh, by itself is not possible or doing it by itself is not going to take care of the entire problem. I'm sorry about that. Um, so that I just wanna show as an, an example of another type of a consideration uh, that exists where you can still do the aesthetic lengthening, but we're gonna have to do more than that. So you don't see obviously a lot of these cases are that often, but they do come across. So if you're wondering, hey, uh, this patient's showing, showing so much tissue, even if I do that aesthetic length, I've still got this huge amount of display. What, what else can I do? I wanted to show you that this is the option that we would be looking at from a, from a treatment planning standpoint. Uh, so to wrap some stuff up, post-op instructions and medication for these uh, and maintenance for these aesthetic cases. Our general take home for any of these uh, aesthetic crown lengthening cases, post-op, anti-inflammatory is the way to go. Uh, usually morbidity, it's not nearly as much as people think from pictures, but of course we always go with anti-inflammatories as our go-to, unless based off of their medical history, uh, they, their stomach can't handle it. We go with Tynanol instead. Uh, we do give them uh, some type of an antibacterial rinse, usually Paradex to use BID. We avoid narcotics by, by all means possible. Uh, if it's a patient that we did a very significant area and or they tend to uh, bruise or swell very easily or very fair skin, for example, we can also prescribe a medrol dose pack uh, or dexamethasone steroid to help uh, reduce and manage uh, the, the swelling that could occur. Keep in mind, standard of care for these types of procedures, antibiotics, not necessary. You would not prescribe them unless there was a complication of healing and they got an uh, infection which is very rare to see, but obviously it's possible, but antibiotics are not a go-to for us. Now, the instructions we give them as a general rule, I say for about two weeks, no brushing or flossing of that specific area. Those sutures are very fine. We do not wanna have them tearing and causing bleeding and inflammation to that delicate healing. Uh, keep them away from eating anything hard or sharp. Uh, barbecue, like you see, ribs there, hard bones, popcorn, chips, nuts, et cetera, we avoid. We also have them try and chew a little bit more on their posterior teeth as opposed to biting into food, have them cut and chew more on the side. Uh, expect in some cases a little bit of cold sensitivity because of the new amount of tooth structure showing. Again, some patients may have none, but if they do, that's why, and don't be alarmed. Uh, like we said, uh, you know, there's a chance for a little bit of inflammation and swelling. Uh, mobility for these cases, unless we're doing an ex excessive amount, I'm usually not worried about, uh, but I, I have it on there just for sake of completeness. Uh, we have them avoid any heavy exercise, so they're not getting their blood pressure up and causing more soreness on the area. Uh, suture removal, we tend to do it two weeks. If you feel like the adaptation of the tissue is great and you'd rather give it an extra week for healing, you can, but keep in mind the longer it stays there, the more it can also build up bacteria. Two weeks is usually the way to go. Uh, we can, if necessary, by three weeks uh, on a supra, you know, crust the level, in other words, not all the way down to the tissue that we've just done. If we are planning on restoring the case, we can do some uh, initial prep work and temporization if, if required uh, from an aesthetic standpoint a, a couple of weeks in. But in terms of the, the final restoration, as we mentioned in part one uh, of our lecture series, the longer we wait, the better. 10 weeks would be the bare minimum. 
uh, that gold standard is going upwards up to 10 to 14 weeks before we go and do our final impressions. As we, as we know from the literature before, there's gingival creep that can happen for months afterwards. So we want to wait and we want our final impression to be done at the ideal time. Last thing we want to mention, as always, is maintenance. Without proper maintenance, of course, uh, whatever we do from a surgical standpoint will you know, fail and, and have complications. Uh, in, in terms of maintenance, we want to thank our sponsors from Crescent Oral-B uh, for two reasons. One, for what they've uh, produced from a mechanical uh, maintenance standpoint with their I.O. brush, uh, and also from a biologic in terms of their uh, Crest Pro Health uh, toothpaste, and I'll explain why. Uh, this is something I relate to personally because for many of my first few years as a clinician, I frankly didn't think there was much of a difference between any of them. If a patient asked, let's say, you know, as long as you're using something, you know, you're in good shape. But I found that to be very different in my own mouth, which is what led me uh, to working with them and looking into these uh, different products that are out there. So first thing in regards to the, the brush itself and why I like it, I, I used a, a Panasonic uh, Sonicare for years enjoyed it, don't find it to be anything bad, but the level of cleanliness and the level of, you know, just overall uh, plaque removal I feel I get with this brush is night and day more. Uh, another issue I always had was that I always tended to brush too hard. I've actually caused some recession. I need to have treatment on my own mouth, gingival grafting. Um, and a lot of it was just not knowing how, if I was putting too much force. One of many of the good qualities of this brush is as you are using it, it will actually, uh, from a color coordination part, uh, it will light up and tell you if you're using too little pressure and not doing enough uh, plaque removal too much, and of course, causing trauma onto the tissue. When you're in that right zone, it will be lit green. Uh, I was surprised to see the areas where I was consistently putting too much force and some areas where I wasn't. I've been able to adjust it uh, as a result. And like I said, just what I feel from a cleanliness level is sig uh, significantly different. Also, their tuft and tuft uh, design in terms of the brush itself, like I said, in comparison to what I had with my Panasonic, which I used and preached for years, the way it's able to clean and access the area to me is night and day different. Uh, so again, I, I just recommend this to, to my patients in terms of uh, maintenance, because again, if they're not doing a good job cleaning it, I'm having to deal with all the complications later. So it just really does a good job. And lo and behold, I found uh, a lot of their studies that were comparing with the old Sonicare specifically that I always used. And not surprisingly, it matched up with kind of what I was finding. I was having significantly less bleeding on uh, you know, brushing that I would get close to my, uh, you know, hygiene maintenance, I'd start noticing, hey, it's time to go. Uh, I'd really see a significant amount of less bleeding. Again, just uh, a lot more of a clean feeling from a brushing standpoint. And then the last thing with the actual uh, Pro Health toothpaste itself, uh, it, it has stannous fluoride, which this is one of, uh, if not the only uh, toothpaste that incorporates uh, the stannous fluoride and, and what it does that's unique as opposed to all the other uh, type of uh, dentrifice uh, chemicals in there. It's the only one that is combining all of these categories between anti-erosion, again, desensitization, anti-caries and plaque and gingival removal. Um, so what that stannous fluoride is able to do, it's carried over in the right uh, proportion and that stannous and fluoride are separated at the optimal time and level. So it's in, uh, helping inhibit uh, the plaque growth, uh, reducing toxins, and again, direct suppression of, of, of pathogens there. So what we've been able to see with this is that this uh, uh, toothpaste is able to, the stannous fluoride is able to travel up to four millimeters subgingively, which again, <clears throat> for me, from a periodontal surgical standpoint is a game changer. Uh, I'm dealing with osteosurgery and deep pockets all the time. Uh, and anything I can do to get something that can get deeper into the pockets and help them eliminate uh, you know, bacteria, biofilm, and these, you know, viruses and pack, uh, pathogens is, is, a, is a game changer from a maintenance standpoint and, you know, a practice builder and a confidence builder with the patients. So this stannous fluoride is, is able to get in there and keep everything very clean. That's why I go with them. So I thank them for mentioning it. So uh, in wrapping up, we're right at our timing here. The primary conclusions that we want to get for all of these cases as a take home, number one, Give it proper time to heal. Do not rush these cases. Uh, again, 10 to 14 weeks before you go to your final. As I hope you can all appreciate now, 
three millimeters is not the number we want to use as our norm. If it ends up being three millimeters based on our measurements, hey, fantastic. But there's going to be some cases where it's going to be less, some that is going to be more. So make sure you, you do your proper uh, uh, measurements and, and bone sounding. Again, for cases that are going to be restored, utilize some kind of a stent, some kind of a mock-up. There has to be some way to communicate to your uh, surgeon where that uh, final margin is going to end so that they'll know and be able to do their measurements for you on the front end. Do not go in reverse. Do not have them do the work and then try and reverse engineer those crowns. It's going to result in a lot of disaster. So if we do the hard work on the treatment planning end, on the front end, and set uh, our expectations from the start, we're going to be in good control and we're going to get everything to a good final result. So with that being said, I think we ended just on time. Uh, again, a special thanks to Catapult. Again, I, I thank all of you uh, for coming and taking time on, on your evening to be a part of this case uh, and this presentation. I know it was a lot to, to cover. I wish I had an extra hour to show you many more cases and to go in much more detail. But again, uh, for the sake of our webinar and time, I tried to get in as much information for you as I possibly can. So I know it's a lot of, of overload there. Again, a thanks to all three of our sponsors. Um, if anybody ever wants to reach out uh, to me, you're always welcome. Uh, my email is there. Uh, I have my website up there. Again, outside of uh, Perio and, and teaching at Harvard, I have a lot of other passions uh, in terms of developing the ear aid product to help us uh, dental professionals uh, against losing hearing loss, which is, if you look at the literature, a massive problem, both in our uh, losing our hearing and, and systemic health issues. So we're able to kind of protect our hearing. And I've had some interest in helping uh, early grads uh, and early career dental professionals start their careers on the right foot from a financial level. So uh, just some other stuff I'm interested in. Happy to talk perio and, and, and help discuss anything anybody needs at any time. Uh, speaking here from Boston in my house with my dog who behaved well enough where she didn't bark during this presentation, which is great. I thank all of you. Uh, and I will take this opportunity now to stop and, and go through and do my best in the little bit of time we have left to answer as many of your questions as possible. Thanks again. Uh, I'll go through some of these questions. And again, I wish I had more time to go over some of these details. The first one is one I wish I could go over more. And it says, do you know uh, the ADA code? So the good point for that, that I uh, wasn't able to point out during the lecture, because these are aesthetic cases, as we all can uh, know, insurance does not cover that. So keep that in mind. Now, it always can become a little bit complicated when you're, when you're doing the treatment plan. And the reason for it from a coding standpoint is, let's say you're doing K9 to K9. Are you treatment planning six crown lengthenings? Are you treatment planning six gingivectomies? Uh, you know, what are you doing? And frankly, I've had this discussion with a lot of my colleagues because it's always a similar uh, back and forth discussion. Uh, different ways to go about it. Uh, some ways that I've seen it done is that I've seen quads of osseous uh, be, uh, you know, be what's been coded, a sextant of osseous, for example, on the upper right and the upper left. Again, from an insurance standpoint, we're not concerned either way because since it's aesthetic, it's not going to be covered anyways. It's more of just trying to see from a coding uh, and, and, and treatment planning standpoint for our patients how we want to do it. Do we want to charge them, like I said, individual crown link things? just gingivectomies, uh, doing it as a sextant of osseous is another way to do it because osseous surgery is basically doing some combination of, uh, you know, tissue and bone. So um, there isn't, uh, to answer your question, there isn't a one-stop shop code answer for all of this. There's a little bit of a variation. So that's a couple different options of ways you have to go. Uh, so uh, next question if, is if I'd use electrosurgery, uh, and does it result in too much collateral tissue damage and inconsistent result? Uh, good question. Again, like we talked about with the lasers, we focused on the diode laser. Uh, and again, we, we looked at that diode laser specifically because it doesn't do much damage to the bone. Uh, obviously, lasers have come a long way technologically. Now, of course, uh, they're lasers that also claim and do some amount of bone resection. Uh, so, you know, technically it could be an option for myself, given the pre uh, precision of what I'm going for. And you can see the complexity of doing the measurements and the bone sounding. I don't personally feel comfortable uh, using the laser for the GV and the bone removal. I, I like doing uh, that bone removal myself. Uh, 
The other part is, especially if there's an area where there's some very thick bone, I know it was hard to see, but I like that question with the, that case with the lip repositioning, uh, there was very bulky bone there. That's, uh, so there's a lot of osteoplasty that needs to be done there. I don't feel comfortable doing uh, that heavy amount of osteoplasty uh, you know, with a laser either. I would much rather uh, have, have the laser there, excuse me, the, the round burr there to do it. So that's kind of my take. I hope that kind of helps. Uh, so next question, is there not an option where you do gingivectomy uh, first and, and in less than six weeks do the osteos? So that kind of goes back to what we were talking about from the staged approach. Um, the answer to that is actually no, we wouldn't do the gingivectomy first and then the osseous. Because again, keep in mind, if you did the gingivectomy first, but you haven't done the osseous, during that healing time, that bone is literally going to just push that tissue and you're going to get tissue rebound. So if anything, from a staged approach, you could do the opposite where you raise your flap, you do your osseous first, allow that to heal. And after that's healed, you can then go back and do your gingivectomy. But if you do the gingivectomy first, that, that tissue is just going to simply rebound as a result of that osseous. So the other way around would be the way to go. Uh, next question, uh, is using Botox comparable to lip repositioning? Uh, it's, it's a good question. My short answer would be no, uh, partially because, well, first of all, it, it just depends on how much repositioning you need. Uh, there might be a case where the amount of repositioning is, is, is very minimal. Uh, it might be a case where the repositioning is quite significant. So uh, that, can really, uh, that can really vary. I'm just scrolling through here. Yes, while you're saying this, I'm going to quickly see if I can't race to give you this example. Talk about more bonus here, sorry to keep you guys here a bit more, but you'll appreciate exactly the answer to that right now. So zooming through this for you very quickly, here is a case for you that you can see where again, on smile, you've got a very excessive amount of gingival display that's showing. And again, even if we do uh, crown lengthening there, it's going to just be too long. And you can see just how much tissue this patient is showing. This was a case that re lip repositioning was indicated. But once we spoke with the patient, they were overwhelmed and, and didn't want to do it. Uh, the only reason I show this and I show you this picture there is if you look at a case like this, and, and, we're, and we're talking about Botox, if you look at her smile line and her lips and the way it looks, no, no amount of Botox is, is going to be sufficient to bring that lip down. And if you are doing it, heck, that patient's going to be so Botoxed up. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to look very good. So that's why my short answer is no. Uh, lip repositioning is, is a much more different uh, and more obviously permanent thing too. With Botox, of course, over a period of time, you're going to have to keep repeating it. That's not going to be the case, obviously, with doing this lip repositioning. It's going to be a one and done. Uh, so next question is how to handle if there's minimal attached tissue and do you want to cut it away, though the patient would benefit from aesthetic crown lengthening? Uh, that's a great question, uh, and it goes into some of what we were saying in terms of our different types of altered eruption, the type 1, type 2. Again, usually what we're seeing in almost every case when we're getting these uh, aesthetic cases, if they have this excessive gingival display, that is basically going to be attached tissue. So you're not really gonna have cases where you've got this excessive gingival display where all of that tissue is unattached. So what you have to keep in mind in a case like that is, again, uh, if we're keeping the patient's own dentition, then we would be doing everything based off of the level of the CEJ. So let's say they maybe didn't have as extreme of an attached tissue attachment zone as what we saw in some of these cases, and it's a little bit less you still wouldn't be able to successfully do the lengthening without removing up to that CEJ. So if you found, for example, that removing up to the CEJ would leave them with no attached tissue, well, that would be a great thing to identify in the diagnostic phase. And then that would be something to discuss with that patient before you ever treated them, because that might be a reason for you maybe to not do it. So again, remember a lot of these cases too, there's nothing periodontally wrong with the patients, it's more of an aesthetic thing. So uh, usually that's not a consideration, but uh, the, the short answer to it is, uh, if you're seeing you would be removing all that attached tissue, it'd be something to talk with them uh, about and, and decide whether or not that's something you wanna do. So 
Uh, moving down, uh, can you recommend a book for crown lengthening? Uh, I wouldn't say there's a, a specific one I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, there's a textbook by Carranza, uh, which is just a general periosurgery one, but uh, it has a lot of great detail in that. I think Jan Lindy uh, also has some textbooks on some different periosurgery procedures, including this, which should be great. Um, those would be the other one. There's another book by Rosen Mealy. Uh, that is a little bit more going into the, the medical side of stuff as well. So it's kind of good in the sense that it's comprehensive. But in terms of a straight kind of uh, surgical treatment, I think uh, Carranza, Lindsay, uh, Lindy would be two good ones for you to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, next question, if there's any post-operative sensitivity due to cementum exposure during the ostectomy, uh, great point again. So again, if we've done our uh, aesthetic case where we've kept the patient's dentition intact, what we are expecting is that that tissue is healing at the level of the CEJ, right? So we are actually not expecting to have root exposure. So if we don't have root exposure, the only thing we're, we're doing everything down to is all enamel. So we're not expecting to get uh, sensitivity uh, in terms of any type of root exposure. However, if we end up doing a little bit of excessive uh, amount of removal, then obviously that's a possibility. And if we're going through uh, the cases where we're restoring the teeth, uh, and again, we've, we've done our removal and now we maybe have an area with more tooth showing, it is possible to get a little bit of sensitivity similar to what you would for a regular, you know, more traditional crown lengthening. But of course, that's a temporary thing by the time you at least can uh, super press the leave, you know, prep and, and attempt those teeth if you want. And then that's not a problem either. So uh, next question, can the patient with lip repositioning move their lip normally? Great question. Uh, the, the first thing I would say to you is that during the initial healing, no, they cannot. It's, it literally and figuratively looks like you've sutured their mouth shut. And it's not that their mouth is shut, obviously they can open, but because of the extreme change and the tight way you've uh, closed everything, the amount of lip uh, movement is not going to be normal at the beginning. In fact, there are some patients that during that first week, maybe even beyond that two weeks or more, will uh, give a little bit, have a little bit of a numbness sensation there. Uh, the good news, of course, is that as things heal, of course, as the sutures are removed, which, which gives a lot of relief as well, and as the tissues mature, um, that, that uh, lip movement is, it, it comes back and obviously they can do everything like they did before. The lip movement, everything is normal. The only difference is rather than having this massive amount of, of display, obviously that display is now back to a more uh, aesthetic uh, and, and what we would want. Uh, healthier uh, level. So we got through all the questions again. Thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, again, questions, anything you need, feel free to reach out. Feel free to look at uh, the website for any other upcoming lectures. Obviously, check out the Catapult website for future lectures. I'm sure we'll uh, have more of these that will repeat over time. And hopefully, I'll have an opportunity to, to meet some of you and and uh, have even uh, longer longer time to show you these things in even more detail, but we, we did all we could in two hours. So everybody have a great night. Thank you very much.